Hey, so today's episode is actually sponsored by me, yours truly. If you've been listening to The Virtual Couch for a little while now, you've heard me mention typically right after the intro that I've uh, recently co-authored a book along with author Josh Shea, who wrote a book called The The Addiction Nobody Will Talk About. And our book is called He's a Porn Addict, Now What? An Expert and a Former Addict to Answer Your Questions. And I've already been taken to task by kind emailers and clients alike for uh, when I say that it's not quite a page turner in the likes of John Grisham or Catherine Stockett. And I've simply said those things out of humor because I really am grateful, first of all, for Josh asking me to be the co-author of this book. And you'll hear more from Josh and me about this book in a future episode. But quickly, after he released his first book, The Addiction Nobody Will Talk About, he went on to some uh, do some 70 or more radio and TV and podcast interviews. And he came back to me and pitched a book idea because he said that he felt more of, uh, of a connection with me. And again, I'm really grateful. So quickly, the book has chapters that are full of questions that are asked by people truly in the thick of things. People who have just discovered that their spouse has been looking at uh, pornography or maybe acting out uh, with compulsive sexual behavior for years, sometimes even decades without their knowing, or that they had said that they were fine or that they had stopped previously but continued to act out, hiding what they were doing and often making their spouses feel bad for even following their own instincts or intuition or, or even just asking questions or sometimes worse, just flat out denying that their spouse, uh, the, the information or data their spouse was presenting to them as clear evidence of the betrayal. And I understand that from someone who has worked with, again, 11, 1200 uh, people who have been trying to overcome um, pornography. So let me quickly read just a couple of the reviews that are coming in from the advanced copies of the book that were sent out to some professionals in the field. And then we're going to get on to today's show. Here's a review from Carol Jorgensen Sheets. She's a licensed clinical social worker. She's, she's a certified sexual addiction therapist. She's the author of Help Her Heal, an empathy workbook for sex addicts to help their partners heal. She's host of Sex Help with Carol the Coach and Partner Betrayal Recovery Podcasts. And Carol said, compulsive problematic sexual behavior is riddled with denial and the authors cut through the normal defense mechanisms that occur to keep this problem a secret. They show great empathy for the spouse who naturally wonders if she wasn't enough. And this book cuts to the chase and helps the reader find hope and strength and recovery through the chapters. She said it's as if you were in the office talking to a counselor and a sex addict and they are reading your minds as a couple who are seeking help for the first time. Tony Overbay and Joshua Shea show a real passion for helping to navigate you through the process of porn addiction recovery. I love that one. And one more today. Um, this is from Mark Golston, and he's an MD. He's the author of uh, Just Listen and Discover the Secret to Getting Through to Absolutely Anyone, which is a great book. He says, this is one of the most helpful books for porn addicts and the people who still love them. One of the most courageous and timely books to help with a widespread and almost never talked about epidemic that is ruining marriages, careers, and lives. It will give hope to millions of people who are addicted to pornography. And I love that um, because he's absolutely right. This book does give hope to people who are really struggling with their addiction. So I highly encourage you to find the book on Amazon, pre-order it, add it to your wish list, share it with somebody that you might know that's dealing with betrayal trauma, who might be going through a rough patch. Again, as one of the reviewers said, this is for both the betrayed as well as the addict. I promise you, this really is a book full of hope. So look for the link in the show notes or go find it on Amazon. And uh, let's get to the show. Coming up on today's episode of The Virtual Couch, we are going to talk about a surefire way in a mere eight weeks to change the neural pathways of the brain. That's right. I am talking mindfulness, meditation, being present, but do not touch that dial. I promise you're not going to want to miss this episode. I'll get to the bottom of what it actually means to be present and why that is important. And we'll try to do it with as few cliches as possible. So that and more coming up on The Virtual Couch. of the virtual couch. I'm your host, Tony Overbay. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified mindful habit coach, writer, speaker, husband, father of four, ultra marathon runner, co-author of the best-selling book. He's a porn addict. Now what? An expert and a former addict to answer your questions in which I play the role of the expert and creator of the path back an online pornography recovery program that is helping people reclaim their lives from the harmful effects of pornography. If you or anybody that you know is struggling to put pornography behind you once and for all, and trust me, it can be done in a strength based hold the shame, become the person you always knew you could be way then please head over to pathbackrecovery.com and there you can download a short ebook that describes five common mistakes that people make when trying to get pornography out of their lives once and for all. Again, that's pathbackrecovery.com. 
And please visit Virtual Couch on Instagram. There's weekly question and answer sessions as well as a little bit of Instagram TV. So please follow along there. And you can find the Virtual Couch page on Facebook as well as Tony Overbay Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist on Facebook as well. Go like them both. Why not? And if you have just a minute and uh, you've enjoyed any of the Virtual Couch podcast material, please do me a favor and rate and review and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast episodes. Had a birthday about a week ago. I turned 50. And uh, thank you for the, uh, the, excuse me, there's some email and text birthday greetings. I really appreciate that. But I had even uh, asked, hey, maybe for my birthday, you could go rate or review or even subscribe to the podcast. And um, there were uh, were a lot of reviews. So I really appreciate that. Um, uh, Here's to the next 50 years, right? And you might have noticed the change in the opener. So um, co-author Josh Shea and uh, my book went live yesterday on December 1st. And I uh, was just, again, happy to say and grateful um, that it debuted as uh, the bestseller in the category of sexual health recovery. And the reviews have been wonderful. And I read a couple of them on the ad before the episode, but they do continue to come in. And um, I, I just feel like I just want to keep saying that I'm grateful and it's wonderful and I can't believe it. And uh, for those who have no interest in that topic of pornography addiction or betrayal trauma, then, you know, I want to say, hey, I apologize for going on and on about this, but this is something and I'm, I'm writing a little piece about this right now, but it's just something that I never really imagined when I did a career change um, 15 years ago or so that uh, that I'd be talking about a book that's been uh, that's helping people. So um, bear with me a little bit. Uh, I wanted to read a review that had just come in from Brandon Patrick. He was a guest recently on the Virtual Couch. Brandon is the host of the expert. He's the host and the expert of the podcast, The Betrayed, The Addicted, and The Expert. And here's what Brandon had shared. And these reviews are up on the Amazon page for the book. Um, they're the the professional reviews. Um, and it, but Brandon said. Uh, This book is a unique yet powerful way of exploring the principles of recovery. They don't shy away from tough topics and tackle things that may be hard for some to hear. Through this dialogue format, it's a great way to get educated about what really is needed for recovery. If you've been stuck for a long time in addiction and you want to know the way out, then read this book. And I'm just truly grateful for Brandon in commenting on that because he's been in the field of betrayal trauma for a long, long time. He is truly an expert. So please follow the link in the show notes and take a look at the book either for yourself or your spouse or somebody that you may know that's going through addiction either as the addict or the spouse or the mom or the dad or the sibling, whatever it is. I, I really do think, and, and again, I've mentioned this before and I will, I will get on um, past this, but it, just reading Josh's answers as the addict, we didn't know each other's answers when we were posed the questions. And uh, it's been pretty, it's been pretty incredible. Um, I, I've been, I find myself going back and reading a lot of the things that he said. So it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's very helpful. All right. On to today's topic. And I'm going to try to be brief today the, because the last episode on trauma bonding to a narcissist, I know was heavy. And, uh, but I will say again, I've received more feedback in the days since the release of that podcast than truly from any one that I've done before, as far as the sheer volume of emails that I've received. And just a reminder that if you're interested in learning more about an upcoming group or program to help those who, who may be in a relationship with somebody who may be um, a, a narcissist or may be struggling with narcissistic tendencies, please email me at contact at TonyOverbay.com or you can go to TonyOverbay.com and write me through the contact form. And again, that will only go to me. So today's topic, when, when, and, and so again, my goal is to be brief today. Often when I talk about the concept of being present or being mindful, I'll refer to research that shows that uh, eight weeks of a mindfulness practice can literally change the wiring of the brain, and I'll say it oftentimes in passing. And over the past couple of weeks, I've had a new client or two, as well as a couple that I've worked with um, for a while now, just ask more questions about mindfulness. And I know that they're coming from a place that in my office, they, they just need to be honest with me. Um, because a lot of times I know that when people hear the concept, the phrase, the, the, the word mindfulness or meditation, they tune out. And some of you might be doing that right now. And I just, I would implore you to just hang tight here for a minute because I was that guy for years into my therapy practice as well. I still remember when people would say, you know, when you get anxiety or when you're, when you're um, heading down a bad place in your thoughts, you know, just take a breath, do some breathing. And I would even say that in my office. And it's one of those things where you don't know what you don't know. So even when I would say, do you, do you, do you ever just stop and take a breath? People would say, yeah, absolutely. You know, I do that. And I'd say, okay, good, good. All right. Sounds like you're being very present, very mindful. And it wasn't until I went to a training, and it was specifically a training for acceptance and commitment therapy, where a big component of acceptance and commitment therapy is this concept of mindfulness. And mindfulness is a way to then defuse from thoughts. And so I wanted to even start, and it's so much more than that. Let me, let me say, as a matter of fact, I wanted to talk about what it's not. And, and here's the thing that I think there were a couple of people this week or the last week 
that I'm so grateful they asked the question where they just said, you know, I sit down, I try to do some mindfulness practice, whether it's a, a guided meditation session through an app or whether it's something that they've read online. And they just say, I just, I can't stop my thoughts. I can't just make my mind go clear and calm. And I always say, hey, guess what? Yeah, I can't either. I mean, that's a, uh, go listen to, I got a couple episodes on um, ADD. I mean, I've got that stuff going for days. And, and it kind of hit me that, uh, thank goodness, one of the, uh, one of a newer client that I'm working with said, okay, what is it? You know, can you just explain what mindfulness is? And it's one of those things where I had to step back and say, man, how do I kind of sum this up uh, in, in a very tangible or easily digestible um, description? But so I want to start about what it's not. So what mindfulness is not is not simply about being calm. And it's not about the absence of thought. And it's not about just being complacent with the, well, it is what it is, mindset. It's, you know, and it's not just a, it's not a silver bullet. I mean, I realized that as well. Somebody had shared with me once a while ago what mindfulness is, and it, and it is, it's a dedicated effort. It's, it's a practice. Um, it's work, and it's a fair amount of work at first. And this is why I love that it's often tied in with acceptance and commitment therapy, because even if I'm just going to trust that, uh, you know, so many people that talk about mindfulness or articles or podcasts or things that you listen to talk about mindfulness being a positive thing. So if my goal then is to try a mindfulness practice, just sit back and say, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to be mindful. I'm going to do a, I'm going to do an app or I'm going to try to take five or 10 minutes each day. And I'm just going to try to just breathe and be calm. And you might get that little dopamine hit. It might be like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then your brain's going to start making up those reasons, those excuses why this isn't going to work. Well, I tried it before. It doesn't work. Um, my mind just races a thousand miles an hour. I don't have time in the morning. Uh, I, you know, and, and again, those are all just stories that your brain's trying to hook you to or fuse you to because if they can get you to buy into those stories, then you don't have to do the really hard work of trying to find time and trying to learn a meditation or mindfulness practice. So remember, that's one of those concepts of acceptance and commitment therapy that I just find beautiful is, uh, is almost how formulaic it can be. Your brain wants path of least resistance. And again, bless its pink, squishy heart. It thinks it's doing you a solid. And if you remember it from that standpoint, that even if you don't like what's going on in your life right now, that's, that's what your brain knows. It, it knows that it knows what's going on right now. But it's afraid of what you might do to it if you start doing something crazy like mindfulness. All of a sudden, you're going to buy a yoga mat, a clip-on ponytail, a big robe. You might get that robe caught, uh, I don't know, in the spokes of your bike or something. I don't know what it would be. But your, your brain's a little bit worried about that. So it's going to come up and tell you all these reasons why that isn't going to work. And, and which is all the more reason that I think it is to say, okay, I see what you're doing there, brain. You know, you're, uh, you're not quite sure what this is going to look like. And, and all the more reasons to learn how to defuse from those thoughts and go back to being present on the road back to mindfulness. So again, over time, mindfulness simply becomes, it's, it's more of a default way of thinking and it's a manner in which you kind of approach and live your life. And I find myself using the mindfulness principles on a daily basis. I've already done it this morning coming into the office. It's really, really early on a what, Monday morning after a Thanksgiving holiday. And I've got a lot to do with the, the book release and I haven't responded to a lot of the things I need to about that book. But I've also got a goal of being consistent with the podcast. I need to sit here and be present and do the podcast. And I find my mind going all over the place to, well, I'll do it as soon as I do this or I'll do this first. And I, and I kind of can step back and kind of say, oh, I see what you're doing there, brain. You're kind of doing the, um, I'll record once I do this story. And I'm not even debating if that's a true or false story. Is it a productive thought toward my goal of being consistent in releasing a podcast? It's not. So I'm going to kind of come back to being present and go right back to my computer and start working on the notes again. And I might do that. And then an email comes in and then all of a sudden I chase that email down. And, and then I have to note that I'm, I'm off on a chasing rabbits over there somewhere. And I'm going to come back to present and start working on this, uh, the podcast notes again before I, before I do the recording. So your brain's constantly trying to get you on these little tangents. And mindfulness can be a powerful way to just note it and kind of just gently bring yourself back to whatever the task is at hand. That's what being present can mean, or it means often for me. And so before I get into a little bit of the research I'm going to talk about today, I like to tell a story, and I've told it long ago, but I, I often, not that I often forget, but I know that uh, it's not that people listen to all 169 episodes. Um, but I, I, when I go speak about mindfulness, I'll often talk about the day that I was driving home in my light blue convertible Volkswagen Bug. And yes, it sounds as manly as, uh, as I'm sure that uh, the, the sense that I'm kind of putting off there. But uh, let me kind of let me kind of take you into this uh, this time frame at this particular moment and show you how this mindfulness concept works. 
So this bug, I bought this bug and I thought it'd be a really cool bug and it was a convertible bug and I wanted uh, one of my daughters to be able to drive it. And I just, I think there's a part of me that always thought, oh, that'd be cool to be a, you know, a teenage girl in California. You got this, this uh, convertible Volkswagen bug and the wind's blowing through your hair and all is well and, and everybody's happy and rainbows and unicorns and all that kind of stuff. So we buy it and uh, boy, what a lemon. I mean, this thing is just breaking down left and right. And I know nothing about cars. So it's questioning my manly uh, car, carness and not knowing how to fix things. I'm spending a lot of money on this thing. And to the point where the, it's breaking down so much that I'm the one driving it to work all the time. And then the top doesn't even work. I mean, I think we've got duct tape that's trying to hold some lever down for the top. So, you know, I'd had a particularly good day at work, I'm not going to lie. And I was just feeling very present, positive. And I'm driving home on this freeway that takes me back into my town. And, uh, and I, a lot, a lot of times now I'll do this thing where I will turn off an audio book or I love listening to audio books, love listening to podcasts. So I'll turn it off and I'll just say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do a little bit of in through the nose, out through the mouth breathing. I'll be really present and just do a little bit of mindfulness practice. So I'm driving home. I'm feeling good. And I turn the whatever I'm listening to off and I'm just noticing things. I'm noticing the beautiful, um, you know, green trees that are all around me. And I'm noticing that it's a just, just amazing day. And all of a sudden I see this car kind of coming up behind me. And it's uh, and no offense to anyone that drives this. My wife pointed this out as I told this story one night. She's like, I think that some people maybe drove that car, but but it's a uh, it's a, one of these four door uh, Porsche vehicles, and so it's coming up on me fast, really really fast. And I and I'm over in the fast lane. I'm, now I'm going uh, I'm going the appropriate speed in the fast lane. I'm not that guy, but so I see this guy come up on me so fast, and so my mind immediately just goes to this place of you know. And again, I was just noticing things. I was being so happy, and all of a sudden I'm like. Man, that guy just thinks he's so cool. He's got this uh, this incredible car, and he's coming up really fast on me. And I'm in this man. What am I? I'm in this light blue Volkswagen convertible bug that's old that I've already probably spent more than I even paid on. And uh, I got duct tape trying to hold the top down. And I just and all of a sudden, I, you know, I, I I'm thinking all these things about what, what am I doing? You know, buying this lame car and I can't. I don't even know how to fix cars. And I should have bought a different car in the first place. And my daughter doesn't even think this is cool. So within a few seconds, I had gone from just this is the most glorious, amazing day and I'm being present and enjoying everything to I'm this, you know, horrible father and I'm in this uh, crummy car and what's wrong with me? And this guy's got life all figured out that's coming up behind me. And then I recognize all of a sudden I recognize, okay, man, my, my brain is going haywire. So again, it's not about this absence of thought. But I just quickly kind of did a little bit of again, it's in through the nose, it's out through the mouth breathing. What does that do? That lowers your heart rate. And what happens when your heart rate starts amping up is your brain, again, it thinks it's always doing you a favor. So it's starting to rally the troops. It's starting to say, hey, get the adrenaline going, get the cortisol flowing, get that stress hormone going in our brain because it's battle time. It's fight, flight, or freeze time. So, you know, when the heart rate starts to raise, it just kind of plays upon itself. And it's going to continue to raise as you start to amp up because your brain thinks you're ready for battle. So the first thing you do is it's in through the nose. It's out through the mouth breathing. What you're trying to do is just stop your heart rate from just skyrocketing so that the, you know, the, the, the reason part of the brain, that prefrontal cortex, that it's going to come back online. It's not going to just check out and say, hey, uh, you guys let me know when the saber-toothed tiger's gone. You know, right now, you guys do your thing, talking about that fight, fight or flight or freeze part of the brain. So you're trying to lower the heart rate because that helps. That's one of the first things that you can do. At that point, then, it's just be present. I remember just looking at my hand on the steering wheel. As I'm still continuing to breathe, I start looking at the, you know, I focus on the, I think I might have even looked at the duct tape. I'm noticing the duct tape. I'm wondering why it's called duct tape. I'm, you know, I'm, I, and I'm being very present. And then I'm, I'm easing over back into the slow lane as this guy passes. I'm being very present. I'm not going to look over. I'm not going to, I'm just going to, I'm doing my thing. You know, I'm back to just being o- uber present in that moment. So, so there's a story just a little bit about what uh, mindfulness can do. That in one just small instance, because of something else that was going on around me, not even anything that I had done, you can watch how your mind can just go from this everything's great to everything's, everything kind of stinks. Now, which one of those would I rather be in? It's the everything's great moment, because that is being truly present in that moment. Um, the, the chasing down the, this car has been breaking down and why did I buy it and that sort of thing. Nothing productive about that, those thoughts. It's just not. I mean, that, that's something that's already happened. So I need to stay in that present moment. So let me get to a couple of articles. One is called uh, Brain Change. It's called Rewire with Focused Attention. It's by a gentleman named Scott Crabtree, and it's from a website called happybrainscience.com, which I love the name of the, the website as well. But here's what I want to do is he's got a pretty short article, but he re- refers to two different studies in the article, and I'm going to take a moment, and I'm going to chase down each one of those studies, and then we're going to wrap things up. So um, Scott says that in a recent study, a uh, recent study showed that simply paying attention to what's happening in your brain can change it. 
So first of all, and this is the very quick version of that study, because man, I looked up that study, and this was a study for neuroscientists. That study is one called Quantum Physics and Neuroscience and Psychology, a Neurophysical Model of the Mind-Brain Interaction. That's actually the most understandable part of the entire abstract of the article. But what the article basically says is, and I quote, The new framework, unlike its classic physics-based predecessor, is erected directly upon and is compatible with the prevailing principles of physics. So far, I'm not really following it, but here's the part that makes more sense. This study that Scott Crabtree is, is referencing that talks about paying attention to what's happening in your brain can change it, says that this study says that it is able to represent more adequately than classic concepts of neuroplastic mechanisms relevant to the growing number of empirical studies of the capacity, here it is, of directed attention and mental effort to systematically alter brain function. There's the key. This study goes into detail about directed attention and mental effort and how that can systematically alter brain function. And it's one of the first studies that really goes into depth about that this paying attention, directed attention and mental effort can literally alter brain function. So that's the study that uh, Scott Crabtree is referring to. So then again, he says a recent study showed that simply paying attention to what's happening in your brain can change it. And then he said that research has found changes in learning and memory processes as well as in emotional regulation in as little as eight weeks. There's that study that I often hear referenced and the one that I'll talk about often as well. So here's that study. This comes from the uh, Harvard Gazette. And it says, participating in an eight-week mindfulness meditation program appears to make measurable changes in brain regions associated with memory, sense of self, empathy, and stress. So, so again, those are very big ticket items for the brain. Memory, sense of self, empathy, and stress. So the article goes on to say that in a study that will appear in the January, this was back in, I think, 2011, 2012, a January 30th issue of uh, Psychiatry Research and Neuroimaging, a team led by Harvard-affiliated researchers at Massachusetts General Hospital reported the results of their study, which was the first to document meditation-produced changes over time in the brain's gray matter. So, uh, quote, Although the practice of meditation is associated with a sense of peacefulness and physical relaxation, practitioners have long claimed that meditation also provides cognitive and psychological benefits that persist throughout the day, says study senior author Sarah Lazar of the Massachusetts General Hospital Psychiatric Neuroimaging Research Program and a Harvard Medical School instructor in psychology. She says, This study demonstrates that changes in brain structure may underlie some of these reported improvements and that people are not just feeling better because they're spending time relaxing. So there's the key. So this isn't just about trying to find a way to relax or clear your mind. This is directed a directed activity that is literally changing the neuropathways of the brain. Previous studies from Lazar's group and others found structural differences between the brains of experienced meditation practitioners and individuals with no history of meditation observing a thickening of the cerebral cortex in areas associated with attention and emotional re integration. But those investigations, uh, she went on to say, could not be documented that those differences were actually produced by meditation. Um, we'll talk more about that in just a second. For the current study, magnetic resonance images, so MRIs, were taken of the brain structure of 16 study participants two weeks before and after they took part in the eight-week mindfulness-based stress re reduction, and that's called MBSR. Um, at the University of Massachusetts Center for Mindfulness. In addition to weekly meetings that included the practice of mindfulness meditation, which focuses on non-judgmental awareness of sensations, feelings, and state of mind, participants received audio recordings for guided meditation practice, and they were asked to keep track of how much time they practiced each day. And so a set of these MRI brain images was also taken of a control group of non-meditators over a similar time interval. So we've got the brain scans going of, uh, of people who were doing this mindfulness practice and those who were not. The meditation group participants re reported spending an average of 27 minutes each day practicing mindfulness exercises, and their responses to a mindfulness questionnaire indicated significant improvements compared with pre-participation responses. The analysis of the images, which focused on areas where meditation-associated differences were seen in earlier studies, did find increased gray matter density in the hippocampus, known to be important for learning and memory, and in structures associated with self-awareness, compassion, and introspection. So participants reported reductions in stress uh, they were, that were also correlated with decreased gray matter density in the amygdala, which is known to play an important role in anxiety and stress. So it said, although no change was seen in a self-awareness associated structure called the insula, which had been identified in earlier studies, the authors suggest that longer term meditation practice might be needed to produce changes in that one area. But none of these changes were seen in the control group. There's the key, indicating that they had not resulted merely from the passage of time. Um, quote, it is fascinating to see the brain's plasticity and that by practicing meditation, we can play an active role in changing the brain and we can increase our well-being and quality of life, says Britta Holtzel, first author of the paper and a research fellow at MGH and Geisen University in Germany. 
Other studies in uh, different patient populations have shown that meditation can make significant improvements in a variety of symptoms, and we're now investigating the underlying mechanisms in the brain that facilitate the change. Uh, another neurologist named Amishi Jha from the University of Miami, who investigates mindfulness's training's effects on individuals in high-stress situations, said these results shed light on the mechanisms of action of mindfulness-based training, and they demonstrate that the first-person experience of stress can not only be reduced with an eight-week mindfulness training program, but that this experiential change corresponds with structural changes in the amygdala, uh, a finding that opens doors to many possibilities for further research on mindfulness-based stress reduction's potential to protect against stress-related disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and then one more quote, and then we're going to get to some more good stuff. James Carmody of the Center of Mindfulness at the University of Massachusetts Medi- Medical School is one of the co-authors of the study, which was supported by the National Institute of Health, the British Broadcasting Company, and the Mind and Life Institute. So what does that show? It shows that an eight-week mindfulness practice can literally start to change the neuropathways of the brain. Now uh, now I go back to this uh, this article, which was written by, um, by Scott Crabtree, Brain Change, Rewire with Focused Attention. So now he gets back and he says, so how can you practice focusing your attention to create changes in your own brain? So then he says, while science has found that meditation practices are an excellent way to achieve this, and that's another research study that he had linked to, there are many other techniques that you can incorporate into your workday for happiness and brain function boosts. So my, my first go-to is to recommend some sort of, and, and this is just because this is what works in my own experience, is, a, is an app. I use an app called Headspace, and it does, uh, you can do anywhere from, a, I mean, they have one-minute, three-minute, five-minute meditation sessions up to 10 and 20-minute guided meditation sessions for specific topics. I just opened up my app, as a matter of fact, and just looked at some of the topics, and we have uh, stress and anxiety, falling asleep and waking up, performance mindset, personal growth, work and productivity, kids and parenting, life challenges, sports, physical health, day-to-day exercises, students, um, and they also have some uh, on the Headspace app. And I don't get anything for uh, for recommending Headspace. I mean, you know there's other amazing apps, too. There's one called Calm. Uh, there's one that in- involves music called Humley. Uh, there's one called 10% Happier, which is a book that I had initially read that was one of the first things that, that got me really thinking a lot about mindfulness after this training I had gone to. And I'll tell you, over the weekend, I have a, a son who is a, he's a, he's a really good basketball player, and it was one of the first times where he let me talk about um, sports psychology and mindfulness with him. And uh, for any of you sports fans out there, so I've got to work with a few different athletes over the years, and just take a free throw, for example. So a free throw. Some, uh, a, a basketball player has a free throw routine. And I think a lot of times, especially kids when they're young, they want a cool routine that everybody will think that uh, looks cool. But really what a routine is about is you do this routine – you know, say so you dribble the ball a couple times, you spin it in your hand, you shoot the free throw, and you've made plenty of free throws. That's why you continue to practice. It's about muscle memory, those sort of things. So I was explaining to him that uh, where, where mindfulness comes in is as soon as you let that free throw go, it's, it's gone. I mean, there's nothing you can do about um, overthinking it, about worrying about it, about feeling bad about it. It's gone. And what the routine represents is something that you can then get present. And at that point, once you've let go of the free throw, let's say you miss it. Let's say it comes up short or it goes long. Well, the mistake that people often make is they, they think, okay, what did I do different? So now they're going to they're gonna focus on, okay, that one was long, I need to go short, or that one was short, I need to go long. But what mindfulness is about is getting back to being very present with that routine because you know the routine works. The routine, you've made plenty of free throws before, so then it's about, okay, I'm focusing on you know one dribble, two dribbles, I'm focusing on spinning the ball in my hand. You know, I'm, I'm taking a breath. I'm focusing on, you know, the muscle memory. I'm focusing on that shot. Uh, and, and so there's where mindfulness comes into play because too often, especially athletes, will beat themselves up about a miss or about a play that had gone wrong. I remember coaching baseball when I was little and uh, talking about, you know, we needed, a, we needed a toilet bowl flusher. You know, when you make a bad play, you just flush it down the toilet. And now there's going to be plenty of other plays to make, trying to incorporate mindfulness for, uh, for the little people. In that scenario of sports, I mean, it does become more of a, this mindset. There's some uh, pretty cool stories about uh, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, these, uh, these athletes that had had a mindfulness coach. They did daily mindfulness act- exercises. And to the point where, you know, once a shot was let go, there's, there's just no, there's not even a millisecond worth of hesitation of, uh, dang it, I missed the shot or whatever, I need to do anything different. And that, that just response time was often key of what gave them an advantage over their, uh, over their opponents. So, so there's the concept of mindfulness um, from a, an app-based system. There are also other, well, and let me kind of tell you what that looks like as well. So I remember when I went to my first training that talked about using this Headspace app, and they encouraged us, I think Headspace, it does, uh, does have a cost associated for a, a, a year's um, subscription. 
but they have some free mindfulness activities. I remember doing one, I think it was maybe 30 days uh, back when the app was new. And it was 30 days of just the general mindfulness basics. I remember going through about 20 days of them. And it would often have you start by breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth, which I did enjoy. It it relaxed me. I can't lie. And sometimes I would even fall asleep to the point of now where if I'm going to do a 10-minute mindfulness-based exercise, I will set my alarm for 13 minutes just in case I do fall asleep Um, because I'm not going to beat myself up if I do. So I, you, you do the in through the nose, out through the mouth breathing, you become very calm. And then, and then it oftentimes is a series of letting your mind wander. Your mind's going to think all kinds of things. This is dumb. I, you know, you're, you're going to think I've got plenty of things to do. I can't believe I'm doing this. See, this isn't working. And then oftentimes the person, Andy, who is the person who does Headspace, he will say, okay, now I want you to come back and focus on, you know, a sound in your office or around you, or, you know, do a body scan, focus on your back against the, your couch or your, your, you know, your bottom on the seat or your feet on the ground or, and I, and I particularly would struggle with that body scan thing because in my mind, I'm always wondering, well, where, where out on my back, my lower back, my upper back. And uh, I don't know if that's an ADD thing or if it's just uh, that the body scan, because everybody's going to respond to mindfulness a little bit differently. But the one I would enjoy is just focusing on whether it's, I've got a little Zen water fountain in my office. I'd focus on the, 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 the noises, the water noises or the white machine noise in my office or, and then, you know, you're focused on it and then all of a sudden you're thinking of other things. And so it's just a matter of, I almost sometimes say catch and release or, you know, go away and come back where your mind's going to go on these various tangents and you're going to learn how to quickly bring your mind back to present or back to focus. So what that looks like in day to day, and one of the, the easiest ways to notice this is if you ever have had challenges driving, let's say that. And I mean, as far as frustration goes, or people that have struggled with road rage or things like that. So if somebody comes, they cut you off. You know, all of a sudden your your blood pressure goes through the roof, your heart rate elevates. And just being able to kind of take a couple of breaths, focus on your hands on the steering wheel, you know, focus on the sounds around you, focus on the radio playing or singing a song or, or communication with a friend or the sights and sounds or roll your window down and focus on the air blowing into the you know, and all of a sudden you're not thinking about a- an angry response to the person in front of you. If you really get uh, even further into the mindfulness practice, which I love, is it's, it, there's a part of that too that's kind of wishing well upon others. So it's, hey, you know, I hope that person gets where they're going. Or, you know, there's an empathetic response there too of, of uh, you know, bless their heart for having a life that feels so chaotic and hectic that they feel that they have to uh, squeeze out every second on the road. But so mindfulness just becomes, that's where I was talking earlier, where it can become this principle of basically a way to kind of live. Uh, I remember that there are times where, you know, I've talked with people who have gotten pulled over to get a a traffic ticket and they want to be very angry. But then it's like, okay, mindfulness, be present. Um, They've been pulled over, you know, if they were speeding or they weren't speeding or whatever happened. But it's all about being in that present moment or people that oftentimes talk about uh, you know, just feeling bad about things and feeling bad about a lot of things or worrying about things to come. And you can tell, you can see now as we kind of lay this out, if you're consistently worrying about things that have happened in the past or overly concerned about things that are going to come, how often are you present? So if you're there in the moment, and I noticed this even over Thanksgiving, we had all the family in town. It was one of the greatest Thanksgivings ever. And I just found myself just really trying to be in that moment, own that moment, be present in the moment. You know, not there was a storm coming in and everyone was worried about when do the when do people leave? When do they drive back to Idaho? When do they? And it was more about, man, if we got caught up in that, we weren't able to stay present and talk about the, the things that we were there in the moment to talk about, about what's going on in life and, and the things around us. So it doesn't mean that we ignore the, you know, we, we did plenty of talk about uh, plans, planning, when do they leave, that sort of thing. But then once we kind of talked about that, then it was come back to the present. Tell me more about you. Tell me your thoughts about this. Tell me what's going on. A lot of those kind of empathetic statements. So mindfulness is a practice that just continually recognizes or acknowledges maybe where your, your mind is going and then brings you back to present. Because living a life that is present is truly, I mean, that's one of those in those deeper definitions of happiness, of just being able to live a, a rewarding life that is based on your values and goals and that is about being in the present moment, being present with your relationships, being present with your job. Um, being just being as present as you can in any moment. That's what mindfulness teaches over time. All right. I promised that this would uh, not be a uh, long episode. I'm not sure how long it is right now, but I hope that this makes more sense of what mindfulness means. Again, it's not just a um, sitting down on the floor and crossing your legs and saying, Oh, although that is certainly a mindfulness practice, but it's more about just being more observing of your thoughts of, of just kind of being more of a, changing the relationship with your thoughts. In Headspace, there's a great, and you can go look up this, just Google or look on YouTube for Headspace and cars. And uh, you'll see a great, it's about a minute and a half, and it just talks about 
how we need to step back on the side of the road and just view all of the thoughts that we have in our brain as these passing cars going by and just being able to observe them and watch them. And oftentimes we start to get a bit anxious when we see the flow of the traffic that's going by and we'll want to go in and, and, and stop the traffic. We'll want to stop the cars. And when we do that, that's what can bring these feelings of anxiety or stress. So when we notice that, we just need to recognize we need to kind of step back and just watch our thoughts, watch our thoughts go by because we get so caught up on one particular thought, again, in that Volkswagen bug moment where all of a sudden that thought led to anger. Well, there were plenty of other thoughts that were coming after that one. So in learning how to just let go of those thoughts that aren't productive. Uh, one more, one more, um, one of the things I learned at a training long ago was a, a simple mindfulness practice of when I have time, if I'm just uh, on my own, alone, in a line, in a car, that sort of thing, or when I'm trying to go to bed sometimes, it's just you know breathing in through the nose and counting one, and then breathing out through the mouth and counting two, and try to get to 10. And a lot of times you'll find, and, and it sounds like that should be easy, but a lot of times you'll get to one, two, three, and all of a sudden you're thinking about work. And when you recognize that you're not no longer counting, then just come back to the present. And then, of course, you don't beat yourself up about that. And you start over with one again. And that becomes just a very nice mindfulness practice. Because while you're thinking of the number one on the in-breath and the number two on the out-breath, you're not thinking about a lot of the things that uh, might be more stressful that day. And so that's a great example of something where you can just do this practice that kind of brings you back to present or brings you back to center. And there are a whole lot of other examples that uh, I think could help as well. All right. So um, thanks for your time. If you uh, if you haven't done so already, I would recommend um, finding a mindfulness-based uh, app or a mindfulness-based practice or mindfulness-based book, or you can even Google mindfulness activities. But make it a little bit more intentional because, as you can see, if you put in some time doing this and then recognize that your brain's going to kind of fight you on it for a little bit, but you put some time in doing this and you're literally going to change the neural pathways of your brain, and it is going to going to have you coming from a place of more calm. And uh, man, that's what I would love for you to, to be able to do. A place of more calm and, and a place where you can just come back to being present and just be more present in your life in general. All right. Hey, uh, until next time, I'll see you again. On the Compressed couch. emotions flying past Our heads and out the other end The pressures of the daily grind It's wonderful Elastic waste and rubber ghost I'm floating past the Aside the things that matter most Explode, allow the understanding through to heal the 